Hi guys, Tony Rotella here, kicking off Reddit opening of the week number five, in which we will be covering the Open Sicilian. Now, uh, before we dig in, I should probably apologize. Truth be told, I was actually supposed to be opening of the week number one, but true to Tony Rowe form, I took four times the time given to me to finish, and so uh, here we are on February 1st. Uh, talking open Sicilian. I should also apologize in advance for the general quality of this recording. This is my absolute first chess recording video, and so my equipment is most definitely not up to snuff. It probably sounds like I'm recording from a phone booth underwater, and I also probably don't have the polished presentation skills of a John Bartholomew or a Chess Explain, but uh, hopefully day by day, video by video, it'll get a little bit better. By day, I'm an engineer, and my employer generally uh, is smart enough to keep me corralled in my cubicle, well away from customers, uh, presentations, other social interaction, so just bear with me. Uh, anyway, I thought the Open Sicilian would be a good topic for an early opening of the week. The Open Sicilian is immensely popular at all levels. It's very likely in most players' repertoires, either from the white side or the black side. It's super fun, very interesting to analyze, and I figured that also if down the road someone wants to cover any specific variation of the Open Sicilian for a Reddit opening of the week, let's say the Night or the Sveshnikov, the Dragon, and so on, it'd be good that everyone already had gotten a solid introduction to the Open Sicilian as a whole. Um, a quick agenda about how this week will go, hopefully will go. Uh, the, this first video will be a general high-level introduction to the Open Sicilian. Why Black would want to play c5 in the first place. Why 2 knight f3 and 3d4 from white is very likely the theoretically best way to tackle the Sicilian defense. And how the resulting pawn structure after... 2 knight f3 and 3d4 affects how both players are, are going to, to play the middle game. And I thought maybe the best way to show this is with, uh, I don't know, what you might call character games, where maybe one side doesn't play that great and the other side gets to sort of just easily enact their general high-level strategy. I thought that might be a good way to sort of understand what white and black is hoping for overall. And then later in the week, I'm hoping to release a few more videos covering each specific variation of the Open Sicilian in a little bit more depth, show the general ideas behind each variation and uh, maybe kind of where what the current theoretical landscape looks like now. And I thought it's likely that I'll do the dragons in one video, the dragons being either uh, the normal dragon, which is 2d6, and then uh, 5g6, black wants to put his bishop on this very powerful long diagonal, the accelerated dragon, which is 2 knight c6, and then 4g6. He still wants to go bishop g7, but he's hoping that that he gets d5 in one, one, one blow, and then probably a little bit of a discussion on 2g6, um, the hyper-accelerated move order, which which avoids uh, knight c6, bishop b5, in lieu of the knight not being on c6 yet. Uh, so the dragons will probably be in one video. The nidorf, which is 2d6, and then a6. The classical, which is 5 knight c6, and the Skaveningen, which is 5 e6, setting up this small center. That'll probably be one video. The e5 Sicilians will likely be covered in one video together. The e5 Sicilians being either the Kalashnikov with 4 e5 swoons, or the Sveshnikov which looks very similar. Black just throws in knight f6 and knight c3 first, then goes e5. Those will be a video, and then lastly, I'll do a video that covers the e6 Sicilians, where black goes 2e6. 
the most popular variations there being the Khan, 4a6, or the Taimanov, which goes for knight c6. So yeah, look out for those videos, and hopefully I'll also be tossing some kind of file up on my Google Drive at the end of the week that has the my annotations to the games we're going to cover today, and also a little bit more analysis, more theory into the specific variations than I could reasonably cover in a video. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. That's a lot of work. <laughs> and, and I tend to take way too long uh, to do things anyway. Okay, so let's let's dig in. Now, we all know the usual opening principles. Control your center, specifically these four squares, develop your pieces towards the center actively, just as an example, and castle your king away to safety. And specifically with regards to the Sicilian defense, white starts 1e4, best by test, yada, yada, yada so on and so forth and black responds with with c5 well okay so let's 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 actually go back one move why might black want to play c5 in the first place well against most god i'm going to get a bunch of hate comments about this but uh, uh, against most maybe second tier defenses like the french defense white's allowed to set up set up his optimal pawn duo in the center yeah black can test it but White can grab more space, you know, the uh, same against the Karo Khan, or same against even the, the Alakine's defense. White White gets to, to grab more space in the center, set up the pawn duo, and Black has to work a little bit harder to, to fight against the center. And, and for that reason, Black's most popular and most well-respected moves here are E5 and C5. E5, the maybe more classical choice, just an awesome chess move. Black develops just the way white does, gets ready to develop his bishop, rapidly place all of his pieces on great central squares, castle his king away, uh, and so forth. Now, C5, on the other hand, black controls the center, stops D4. Uh, okay, sort of stops D4. Uh, tell that to Ken Smith and Mora, whatever his his first name is. Um, black controls the d4 square, dissuades white from going d4 immediately, uh, and also to his benefit sets up a more asymmetrical pawn structure. So e5 is a great chess move, but in a lot of cases, let's say black is a stronger player than white, he wants to, to try and win even though he gets to move second. In a lot of cases, maybe e5 is slightly less suitable. It's still a great move. You can still play plenty of variations where where the position is unbalanced and you get to fight for a win. But if white is really determined to sterilize the game, let's say, with with something like the Scotch Four Knights or, uh, you know, one of these maybe more symmetrical, more sterile variations, it, it's going to be hard to, to imbalance the game. And in that regard, c5 is, is maybe a slightly better choice if you must win. Now, the downside to c5, of course, is that it in no way helps Black's development at all. This bishop on c8, or f8 rather, is is still not able to be developed. And, and so usually Black falls behind a little bit in development in the Sicilian defense. And and White's most principled way to exploit that lead in development, of course, is to try and smash open the center right away and develop very quickly. So normally he starts with two knight f3, and after uh, some move by black, usually knight c6, d6, or e6. We'll play d6 here. It's the most popular. White smashes open the center immediately with, with three d4. Black is sort of honor-bound to take. Um, and after knight takes d4... We sort of reach a very stereotypical and, yeah, typical uh, open Sicilian. Uh, Black has some trumps. Black has exchanged a non-center pawn. He exchanges C pawn for white center D pawn. And so, a as such, Black has an extra center pawn. What does white get in return? Well, Black, again, is, is hopelessly, not hopelessly, d behind in development. White's pieces will jump out to very active squares very quickly. Bishop can go to c4, e2, d3, 
etc. This knight is going to come to c3. This bishop can go to e3, g5, etc. And white will castle his king away to safety, either on the king side or the queen side, very quickly. On the other hand, and before we move on, white has a little bit more space. So he's got this pawn on the fourth rank, and black is sort of limited to the third rank. And so these imbalances, the, the, the main ones being that white has slightly more space and a lead in development, and black has a more compact structure and an extra center pawn, these imbalances tend to already sort of characterize the game. White is going to try and press that lead in development and, and turn that lead in development and his minor advantage in space into an attack against black. And black, on the other hand, is going to play for the long game. He's going to try not to get his head ripped off. He's going to slowly develop his pieces, try and equalize the center space, favorably uh, transform the pawn structure back to something that, that that's more equal, and then he's going to put his extra center pawn and his structural advantages to, to good use. It's also worth noting that a lot of times when white presses his attack, the structural advantage becomes even more pronounced for, for black. For instance, in the Nidorf, black goes 5a6, and very frequently white goes 6 bishop e3, which signals the so-called English attack. And after, just as an example, uh, I'll, I'll talk about these moves uh, in more depth later, but just as an example, white's general idea is to go f3, g4, g5, frequently with h4, to, to press this advantage on the king side and to start his attack. And these moves are not moves that, that help white structure necessarily. They leave behind a lot of weaknesses. You move a pawn, you can't take it back. And so a lot of times if white's attack does not succeed and black keeps his king safe, he catches up in development, he breaks in the center, um, white's position is, is a lot of times in shambles. And the other thing maybe we should note is that in many variations of the open Sicilian, the key to black equalizing or being better, sort of the, the triumph of black strategy, is the d5 break. And it's sort of easy to understand why that might be the case when you look at the pawn structure. The only significant difference, difference in the pawn structure is that white has the pawn on e4, black has the pawn on d6. This is the only reason why white has more space. And so if black is allowed to go d5, he exchanges off his, his d pawn for white's e pawn, and the remaining in the in the remaining structure, black has one center pawn and white has none. And a lot of times this pawn makes it to e5. In which case the the structural advantage in the center and the space advantage in the center becomes a little bit more pronounced. Uh, as an example, uh, here's a typical variation of the Kalashnikov, in which black succeeds in getting d5 and getting his pawn to e5, and you can really see see sort of the, the triumph of black strategy. So this is the Kalashnikov, and normally white goes knight b5 here to, to force, because of this ugly threat of knight d6 check, to force black to imprison this bishop onto generally the e7 square. But if white plays sort of lackadaisically and he goes back to f3, let's say, black can immediately uh, equalize, probably more. Knight f6, attacking this pawn, developing towards the center, very just standard chess strategy. Knight c3, again, developing towards the center, protecting this pawn. Black goes bishop b4, again, renewing the threat, developing, very just standard chess moves. White goes bishop d3 to protect the pawn, and black can go d5. Uh, d4 and e, uh, d takes e4 are very serious threats, and so white normally has to take, and after knight takes d5, we can see that white's strategy in the opening has already been an absolute failure, uh, and black has already come out completely rosy. This, this e5 pawn's a monster. He has Black has a massive central influence. White generally 
because of the threat to c3 goes here, black takes, white takes back, black goes back here, castles, castles, and uh, white's already in a reasonable amount of trouble structurally, he's kind of a mess, black's going to go f5, and you can sort of see the long-term effects that white is suffering from allowing his c-pawn to be exchanged for the d-pawn, and then the d-pawn to be exchanged for his e-pawn. Black just has a massive advantage in the center. So let's dig into each game. The first game I'm going to show is sort of a triumph of, of white strategy. That being, white develops very quickly and actively, and then sort of just smashes through black's position like a wrecking ball. The second game, on the other hand, White develops a little bit lackadaisically, not not challenging black, not the most ambitious scheme of development. Black plays e5, and then later succeeds in playing d5, cracks open the center, uh, finishes his development, and, and wins a nice game. So let, let's get into the games. Okay, so game one is Larry Christensen versus Alex Vojkovic more affectionately known as Wojo in the States, from the U.S. Championships in, I believe, 2006. This game has an interesting dynamic. Wow, I apologize if you can hear the storm. It's absolutely storming outside my window, probably three feet away. Uh, as I was saying, this game has an interesting dynamic. Larry Christensen is an absolutely fantastic attacking player. He authored two books on attacking chess, in fact, Storming the Barricades and Rocking the Ramparts. Both highly recommended if you if you like his sort of informal writing style and you want to see more of his games. And Wojo, on the other hand, was more solid, and he had a very consistent opening repertoire. As, as White, he always played the same Fianchetto-style, Catalan-ish, 1d4 and knight f3 setups. And as Black, against d4, he mostly played the King's Indian, but against e4... He very habitually played the the Nidorf variation of the Sicilian, and so you have you have someone who's pretty solid and an expert in the Nidorf going up against someone who's who's an attacking expert. And uh, Larry's opening knowledge, on the other hand, I think is much more broad and varied, but probably a little bit less deep, a little less specialized. He played almost everything as white: e4, d4, c4. He was sort of a jack-of-all-trades with, with regards to his openings. And that game continued, started rather, e4, c5, knight f3, so it's there's a good chance we're getting an open Sicilian. d6, the only way to enter the knight orf. C, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, and now a6, which signals the starting of the knight orf. Probably most of you are familiar with the Nidor variation. It's by far the most popular open Sicilian out there right now. Popularized by Bobby Fischer, Gary Kasparov, and nowadays almost every respectable Grandmaster, at least it seems like that to me, has the Nidor in their repertoire. If you're not familiar with why maybe you'd like to play A6, or why how A6 could be the best or most popular open Sicilian, the idea is kind of threefold. The first idea is pretty simple. White has a large number of pieces that can go to b5. And so black plays kind of a spiny pawn move to keep white's pieces at bay. The second is that black is very likely going to go b5 himself, which sort of starts a mini plan based on b4, knight takes e4, perhaps bishop b7, which also adds a little bit of extra pressure to the e4 pawn. So, in a way, black is starting his development with, with b5 and bishop b7. The third, the third reason, and probably actually the most important reason, is that black wants to play e5 at some point. Why are those two moves connected? I, I, I wouldn't blame you if, if maybe it was a little confusing why... Black needs to play a6 to go e5. Well, there's a variation in the open Sicilian called the Cooper Chick variation that just goes e5 immediately. And the problem with this variation is that white can flick in bishop b5 check. And, of course, black cannot go knight c6. White would just take twice. So, no matter which way black blocks the check, let's just say bishop d7 in this case, 
white will take, knight b takes d7, very natural moves, and then white gets this amazing f5 square for his knight. And he's threatening d6, yes, but the, the actual problem here is that this d5 square is extremely weak. Not only did black trade off the light square bishops here, which further accentuates the weakness, but this knight... <clears throat> This knight, now that it has the f5 square, is unusually well equipped to head back to e3, so white might play bishop g5 first, and then knight e3, and then black has to deal with this horribly weak d5 square for the rest of the game, which is pretty ugly. So he goes he goes a6 first, preparing e5 in most cases um, to stop bishop e5 check. And Christensen already plays an, an interesting move here. He goes bishop c4. Not that bishop, bishop c4 is bad. In fact, this is a favorite move of Fisher. Some people call this variation the Sozin variation. Some people, in a tribute to, to Fisher popularizing this move somewhat, they call it the fisher Sozin variation. It's a very natural move. White puts his bishop on, uh, on a very aggressive diagonal right away. It's just that nowadays this move do, isn't all that popular. It, it's, it's much more common for White to fight the Nidorf variation with bishop g5, which is absolutely one of the sharpest variations in all of chess, giving black the option of going into the poison pawn variation, for instance, with, with something like this, when white is going to just try and blow black away. Uh, also popular nowadays is bishop e3, going, going for what we typically call the English attack with f3, queen d2, Castles long, g4, etc. And also nowadays, the odd h3 is becoming popular. Perhaps just because six bishop e3 and six bishop e5 have been analyzed to absolute death. White is going for sort of a, a delayed Kiri's attack kind of setup with, with g4 and perhaps bishop g2. Sometimes white doesn't go bishop g2, he just goes bishop e3, queen d2, similar normal castles long type attacking setups. But Christensen goes bishop c4, and Vojkovic continues with the most popular continuation, e6. Now I just got done saying how white wants to play e5, but th the situation has changed slightly. Now that white has put his bishop on this diagonal, black reasons that he'd like to finish his development with bishop e7 while also blunting the bishop on c4 a bit. Christensen plays bishop b3. If you've never seen this variation before, this move might seem kind of odd, just going bishop b3 without without being provoked, but white reasons that black is almost assuredly going b5, or at least queen c7, attacking the bishop, relatively soon, and so he just remains maximally flexible and gives away the least amount of information by just committing the bishop to b3 right away. And Wojo goes b5. It's also very popular to go knight b to d7 or bishop e7. These are very reasonable chess moves. So if, if you think those moves seem more natural, don't be, don't be too, too hard on yourself. And now Voike, uh, Larry excuse me, plays a, a slightly unusual move. He goes queen f3. This is probably the fourth or fifth most popular move and probably was, was a, a nice surprise. The main line is is castles long, and play typically continues bishop e7, and now queen f3. Do note that queen f3 contains the very dirty threat of e5 with a, a double attack on this knight and this rook. The most typical way to respond to this is queen c7, with the idea that now e5 will be met with bishop b7, a counterattack on the queen. And after the queen moves, black will just take the pawn or move the knight. So after queen c7, white typically goes queen g3, attacking g7. And also in, in some variations, it's just useful to both get off the long diagonal to start to prepare the e5 breakthrough. Black will castle. White goes bishop a6, h6, developing very rapidly, threatening you know the cheat mate on g7. Knight e8 is forced. Rook a to d1, just centralizing the rook, developing naturally towards the open file. <clears throat> and here black needs to find the very precise bishop d7. And you might, you might look at this move and think this is kind of ugly or it's kind of weird. Black has more natural moves. 
He does have more natural moves, but sometimes in chess, the natural moves uh, lose the game for you. If you want, take a second and, and pause your video and ask yourself why bishop b7 might not be the best move out there. Okay, if, if you found bishop takes e6, congratulations. Yeah, this is one of the things that's really tricky about the fischer sozin is that this central, very well centralized knight, this bishop on b3 combined very well to for destructive sacrifices on, on this this sort of pawn constellation here. Especially when you when you consider that sometimes the pawn might make it all the way to f5 as well. So after bishop takes e6, black's in, in a lot of trouble. F takes e6, knight takes e6, queen d7. And white actually doesn't even have to take on f8. He can take on g7. And black's in a lot of trouble. I think white has, yeah, three pawns for the piece and, and a pretty raging attack. Knight b to d7 is the same. Bishop takes e6 is just absolutely crushing. Black can go knight c6, trying to challenge this well-centralized knight here, while maintaining protection of this e6 square so that this type of shenanigans isn't possible. But uh, white actually has other okey-doke style ideas in mind with knight d5. The problem being that after e takes d5, white can play knight takes c6, and queen takes c6 is met with bishop d5, and black's position is totally falling apart. Yeah, so after rook a d1, black typically goes bishop d7, and then white has uh, a ton of moves here. He can prepare e5 with f4, or knight to f3, both looking to blow up in the position with, with e5. Some people also play the somewhat odd a3. I, I presume just to stop b4, but this, this move to me it doesn't look like it can be right. Then lastly, there's the modern move and also the computer preference. Probably that's not a coincidence these days. Knight c to e2. Intending to go knight f4 when either uh, the funny business on e6 is resuming, or white's going to h5, increasing the pressure on this this weak g7 square. So that that's that's more common. The Christian's move, Christensen's move is is a little bit more rare. Also note in this position after castles that b4 trying to pick up this loose e4 pawn is is pretty risky. White will go knight a4, and if black decides to take this, white will play rook e1, and after bishop d5. Uh, d5, sorry, bishop f4. White has a massive lead in development. Black's king is stuck in the center. The f-file is open. Literally all of his pieces except the knight are still sitting on the back rank. Uh, and it's it's actually already really hard for black to keep his position together. For instance, the most obvious move, at least to me, is bishop e7. Shutting down the e-file pressure and looking to castle the king away. But this runs into into trouble after knight f5. And I think the point is that after e takes d5, queen takes d5, hits both the rook and this f7 pawn, and if queen takes d5, bishop takes d5, rook a7, the, the knight on b8 is actually hanging, which is sort of cute. So, and and if if black can't take the knight, he's in, he's in a lot of trouble. <coughs> okay, but Chris, Christensen played f3. Queen f3, which which again threatens this nasty e5 move. It also maybe occurred to Wojo at this point that Christensen is intending to go long, which is sort of rare for the Sozin. It, it White typically wants to castle kingside in the Fisher Sozin attack just because once you put your bishop on b3, you're sort of committed to trying to find a way to, to break through on these these light squares, and by by castling long you more greatly you you strengthen the f4 f5 plan by by already putting your rook on the f file so christensen's going for a little bit of a different idea already by going queen f3 wojo meets the threat of e5 similar to the main line with eight castles by going queen c7 now e5 will be met by bishop e7 of course Christensen, again, develops at max speed with bishop g5, threatening to just win a pawn. Wojo goes knight b to d7. By the way, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this move. I, I couldn't find anything wrong with it, at least. And now, Christensen castles long. Wojo goes bishop e7, just straightforward development, looking to castle. 
And now take a moment, pause your video, and decide how you would continue White's initiative. Okay. Christensen played e5 anyway, despite the fact that it can be met with bishop b7. If you decided to go with the, con the thematic bishop takes e6, deduct a point, uh, it would be perfectly reasonable if black had to take and then takes here, he moves the queen, let's say, to b6, take on g7 check. Knight takes g7, king f7, and knight i5. This is an extremely thematic Sicilian sacrifice, especially in the Sozin. With the knight on f5, white has two pawns for the piece, black's king is a mess, d6 is weak. Um, this looks quite nice. The problem is that after bishop e6, black has the snazzy Zvishin Zhu knight e5 when, when he, he's hitting the queen and also the bishop on e6. So Christensen goes e5. And the, the point of e5 doesn't maybe become apparent until a little bit later. It's really just a line opening sacrifice. Down the line, it will be greatly beneficial to White's attack that the e file is open. So that game, the game continued with bishop e7, pretty much forced, queen g3, and Wojo took on e5 with the knight. Taking on e5 with the knight is not compulsory. There was a game between Serich and Cheparinov who's Topolov second, that went d takes e5, and white continued with bishop e6, relying on the tactical point that e takes d4 is impossible due to this pin. And after f takes e6, knight takes e6, queen to c6, knight g7, king f7, knight f5. We have a position very similar to the bishop e6 sacrifice that I already talked about. It's very unclear. I think computers think it's around equal. Yeah, so very, very close to equal. But Cheparidov is probably a little bit stronger than Sarich, and he, he's an especially strong calculator, and he managed to pull this out as black. So this is an interesting option that Wojo, Wojo could have considered. But he takes with the knight, which is in no way bad. And perhaps, again, pause your video and decide how you would continue as white. Okay, now Christensen played bishop takes e6. And Wojo played f takes e6. Which isn't compulsory, by the way. Stockfish points out that black can just castle here. Now, I I'm willing to bet that perhaps even Wojo looked at this, but rejected it after just a simple bishop b3. White wins his pawn back, has a slightly better structure. Knight f5 is annoying. This bishop is a relatively strong piece, even though knight c4 is possible. I think white is probably a little bit for favor here, and, and Wojo didn't want to mess around with this. So he took... And, all right, I know this is getting annoying, but for the last time, pause pause your video and see if you can, you can continue like Larry C. continued. Okay, Larry went 14-F4. Probably exclam. Probably also preparation, by the way. I think with Wojo having such a consistent opening repertoire, it's actually very likely that Larry reached this position on his computer at home before he, he got to the U.S. Championships. And this, is a no this, I think, at the time was a novelty. There was another game that actually reached this position that took place two years before this game in 2004 between Grandmaster and, I think, former women's European champion, Katerina Lano. She plays on the Ukrainian Olympiad team also. And she took on E6. The problem with taking on E6 now is that after Queen C8... Probably queen d7 is also possible. Whoops. After queen c8, knight takes g7, king f7. Knight f5 is no longer possible because the queen guards it. Now that the knight is, is no longer on, on the d7 square, this queen guards f5, and white's sort of forced into, into putting the knight on h5. And the Lano game continued. Queen f5, knight takes f6, queen f6. But this is quite a bit worse for black than, than let's say, the Sarich and Cheparinov game. Quite a bit worse for white, rather, sorry. Um, he's running out of wood to throw on the fire, and knight c4, b4 are coming. Black's king is relatively safe. Rook c8 is coming. The bishop on b7 is a really strong piece. White has two pieces for the pawn, but I don't think it's going to be enough here. I think he's very likely quite a bit worse. Yeah, computers don't like this variation at all, so... Uh, an improvement was needed, and I'm willing to bet Christensen found this improvement at home. 
And here, Wojo actually already probably made the game losing blunder. He played knight g6. And then Christensen took took on e6. We'll look at this in a second. It's worth it's worth noting that that computers already think that Black has to give the pawn back by protecting e6 in some way. They suggest king f7 or bishop c8. Both both are kind of weird. For instance, bishop c8, f takes e5, uh, d takes e5. I'm not sure most players would really want to go into this as black. Just th this is pretty ugly. But yeah, th th those two things were options. After knight g6, knight takes e6, queen d7, again, black white does not want to take on g7 check because after knight takes g7, king f7, again, he'd have to go bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, knight h5, which is which is not so good. The, the point of Christensen's line of play, starting all the way back with 11 e5, actually, is that he can just go rook e1 now. Now that the, the, the e pawn is missing, the e file is open, and this massive kraken of a knight on e6 can just sit there all day, stopping black from castling. And already it's really not that easy to find a way to unravel, a way to connect the rooks, a way to get your king out of the center. Position is extremely uncomfortable for, for black. What does a computer say? Yeah, once it, it starts thinking about it, it, it starts to not like, not like black's chances so much. So after rook h e1, Wojo went king f7, I believe. Just trying to connect his rooks, get his king off the e file, protect the g7 pawn, and so on. And but already Christensen's attacking moves start start flowing very easily. The game continued f5, and Wojo was forced to go back to f8. Knight e5 runs into the simple rook takes e5 because of this this pin down the d file. And after knight eight knight knight f eight, excuse me, <coughs> Christensen finds a nice way to continue. He goes bishop takes f6. The point being that g takes f6, queen g7 picks up a rook. He's forced to go bishop takes. And but the, but the problem is that just this hangs the deep deep on with tempo. And after rook takes d6, queen c8. Christensen finds another very strong move, knight g6 check. Which looks kind of weird because it gives black the opportunity to, to chop this knight off, but after bishop takes g5 check, queen takes g5, rook e7 is a massive threat, and it, it's actually incredibly hard for for black to find find a real defense here. Uh, one sample line, th let's see what the computer thinks. Yeah, plus, plus almost 8, this is just an absolute debacle. One funny line I think is... Um, is queen c7 f6, knight g6 protecting against rook e7 again and protecting against queen g5, rook e7 anyway, knight takes e7, queen takes e7, actually just mates. Totally horrific. So yeah, after this, Wojo was pretty m sort of honor bound to go king g8. And, well, I could have made this a quiz problem, except I kept the engine on. Yeah, Christensen continues rook f6, just trying to expose the king down the g file. And after g takes f6, knight e4, Wojo was basically forced to go knight g6, throwing throwing the knight to its death. The point being that king f7 loses to knight d6. Very pretty mate. <coughs> But after knight takes g6, or uh, knight g6 rather, f takes g6, Wojo resigned. His, his position is just completely falling apart. And he just he just never managed to get, get a, a reprieve from the assault. One funny line to finish, just to, to show you guys, is bishop takes e4. Uh, just trying to chop as much wood off as humanly possible. Knight takes e4. Queen f5, stopping knight f6, g7. <laughs> trapping this hapless rook in the corner. So yeah, an interesting game, uh, an awesome game by Christensen, quite a display, most likely some very nice preparation, but also illustrates the sort of fundamental idea that white needs to grab the initiative in the Sicilian and never let go. Okay, so that's game number one. Let's move on to game number two. Let's clear this out.
And game two is between Jose Tiago Mangini and the man himself, Miguel Nidorf. I was searching for a game between a high-level Grandmaster as Black and someone who's maybe not as high-level to sort of illustrate how a stronger Black player can use the Sicilian defense to gain more practical chances. And it actually turned out that this game was sort of everything I wanted. Black got to break with d5 and imposed the better structure. He slowly outplayed his opponent after some lackadaisical opening play, and it was Nidorf playing the Nidorf. So <laughs> it, it was the, the trifecta of, of perfection here. So the game obviously continued e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, a6. Nidorf again. And Mangini played bishop to e2. Just as we talked about in the last video, it's quite a bit more common nowadays for more active moves to be played. Bishop g5, bishop e3, h3. But bishop e2 is, is not a bad move. I, I sort of feel deep down in the darkest depths of my heart that bishop e2 cannot be the critical move against the Nidorf, but it's always been played by players who prefer a slower, more positional maneuvering game. Carlson has played it quite a bit, especially sort of in the last months of 2015. Karpov played it a ton. It's not a bad move, I just think maybe it's less to the point than it should be. And so Nidorf continues with the typical Nidorf counter-strike in the center, e5, and white goes knight b3. Knight f3 is is actually possible and is not bad. Black can continue with bishop e6 or bishop e7. I think an interesting idea is to go h6 here. Both stopping bishop g5, which would accentuate the weakness on d5, and also planning to go bishop e6 when knight g5 is, is no longer an annoyance. Uh, typical play might be castles, bishop e6, bishop e3, bishop e7, Queen d2, castles, rook a to d1, knight b to d7, something very normal. But uh, I, I did see an interesting game that, that caught my eye in which white played a4. This is, I think, Katarina Toma versus Jan Nepomnishi. This was a blitz game from 2011. And Nepomnishi went bishop e6. Again, black is, is sort of angling for d5 at some point. Castles... Knight d7, a5. This is one of White's major ideas in, in this bishop e2 line is to go a4, a5, clamp down on the b6 square and make sure that Black can't play b5 himself. Possibly knight d2 to c4 is coming, bishop e3, etc. Uh, Nepomnishi played rook c8, and after rook e1, bishop e7, bishop e3, Take a moment, if you're familiar with the Sicilian, you probably jump on this move, but if you're not familiar with the Open Sicilian, this is a very thematic idea that's important for you to, to know. So take a second, think about it. Okay, black play, rook takes c3. Giving up an exchange, in exchange for this shattered queenside structure and this e-pawn. And this totally unleashes uh, Black's large central majority, too. Now White has zero center pawns. Black has both of these. Maybe even the F pawn can get involved in the action. And I think Black is already better. And I think Nepomnishi also managed to win this game. Very typical, especially in the Dragon. We'll see a little bit later. Because when you put the Bishop on G7, smashing through on C3 becomes a little bit more enticing. But, yeah, just an interesting game that I thought uh, was worth showing. After Knight B3, one of the, the sort of important things white needs to address is is what to do about this knight right now because of this pawn and this pawn and and the queen this knight really has basically no future and so one of the most typical middle game themes in these classical nidorf variations is how white redirects this piece to a useful square sometimes it goes knight c1 to d3 to maybe trade off for a knight that's made it to c5 Sometimes it goes knight d2 to f1 to e3 to sort of hop in here or here. Sometimes it goes knight d2 to c4 
and you know white's trying to probably not that square white's trying to go to the weak b6 square pressure pressure d6 uh Nidorf continued pretty normally with bishop e7 bishop e3 bishop e6 castles castles and now i think white played a move that's a little bit inaccurate he played a4 and we'll see what the problem with this move maybe is in a second. More typical is 10 queen d2. Just looking to connect the rooks and bring a rook to the d file, start maybe operations against this d pawn. Uh, the main line normally continues knight b to d7, and now white goes a4. That's a hint for later as to why a4 might not be that great uh, in, in the main game. And typical play would be something like rook c8, a5. Queen c7, rook fd1, rook fd8, and now a lot of times white plays the very interesting queen e1. Try and take a second and think about white, why might, why white might want to play this move. Okay, and again, it, it comes down to him wanting to fix this knight. A lot of times white needs the d2 square to fix this knight, and so he, he's looking to go into c4 now that he's got this sort of pseudo clamp on on the b6 square okay so after castles white played a4 now pause your video take a second and think about why a4 now instead of after queen d2 knight b to d7 might be slightly imprecise okay and the reason is that Black can go knight c6 now and exploit this this weak b4 square. This is a very, very juicy square for this knight now. Again, it would be highly advantageous for black to play d5. And it's otherwise hard for black to use this knight in the fight for d5, except for the fact that now he can go to b4. It's not also insignificant that after rook c8, there's some minor pressure on c2. So a good question then is is why after queen d2 uh, does black not go knight c6 here? Well, the problem is is that now after knight c6 here, b4 is not a totally stable square, and the knight blocks the c file, uh, and I think it's also a little bit vulnerable to knight d5. So for instance. Rook fd1, rook c8, f3, preparing uh, knight d5 by protecting the e-pawn. Queen c7, rook a to c1, rook fd8. These are all sort of natural moves, and now knight d5 is actually kind of annoying. Um, the point being that black can't capture with the knight because he would he would lose a piece to a fork after e takes d5. And if he capture, captures this way, this knight doesn't really have any good squares to go to. And probably this is very likely sort of uncomfortably better for white, who can go c4 and, and start put thinking about pushing c5. or Yeah, it, it's just a little bit less comfortable. Uh, it's very typical in the knight or that the knight goes to d7 unless white sort of imprecisely plays a4 early, in which case black might want to go to the b4 square instead. So Nidorf did indeed play knight c6, and again, white played maybe a, a slightly dubious, kind of unambitious move in 11f3. Let me turn this off just so it's not, there's no cheating. Uh, it's just not very energetic. It doesn't put a lot of pressure on black. More common, way more common is f4. f4 is okay. The, the issue is that after e takes f4, uh, let's say rook takes f4, or bishop takes f4, the e5 square is a pretty juicy square for, for black's knight. There's also just queen d2, that's a very natural move. It, it might be the best move in this position, but Mangini played f3, and after knight b4, he played sort of another do-nothing move. I, in this position, I don't totally understand uh, why he'd want the rook on e1 instead of on f1. Maybe he wants to go bishop f1 and generate some pressure against the e-pawn after d5, but it just seems kind of a little bit loose to me. So, Nidorf continues with rook c8. And finally, Mangini decides to start trying to do something about this knight on b3, and he goes knight c1. Presumably because 
this knight on b4 is extremely annoying. He wants to try and trade it off. But his timing's a little off, and already Nidorf can strike with d5. Exclam. And after e takes d5, knight f takes d5, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, hitting the bishop on e3. Black is already sort of clearly better. So he's got the d5 break in. He's destroyed white's central presence. White has no center pawns left. Black has this this very well-placed pawn on, on e5. And after bishop f2, already black starts improving his position very easily. Queen c7, hitting c2, preparing rook fd8, starting to x-ray this queen. And you can already see that, that white's pieces are already like really awkwardly placed. And knight on c1, bishop e2. All of these pieces are really passive and kind of awkward. And black's pieces make a very uh, strong centralized impression. I I'd already say that black has a pretty large advantage here. And after c3, just meeting the threat on the c2 pawn, Nidorf kept improving with knight f4, Mangini retreated, rook fd8, queen to c2, and uh, now take a second and think about how you might you might improve black's position even further here. Nidorf decided to go with g6, exclam. I think this is a pretty strong move, sort of subtly strong. Um, the idea is to very likely go bishop f5, and, and you're, you're starting to look at some of these central uh, squares, and also, well, we'll see in a second the, the, other, the other reason why this might be quite good. So then, again, decide after g3 what you might play as black. Okay, sort of spoiled it. Black played bishop f5. And after queen b3, he went knight h3 check. And white took, and black took back. Now, the difference here, and this is important to understand, is that black could, in fact, go knight h3 immediately without inserting bishop f5 and queen b3. And after bishop takes h3, bishop takes h3, the position would be nearly identical. The difference is that in the game... Now that the queen is not on c2, it's no longer protecting the d2 square, and rook d2 is starting to look really unpleasant. So, so Nidor very precisely keeps his initiative going in, in a slightly more accurate way. And already this is just a complete uh, failure for, for white. Black has the two bishops now. His king side, white's king side, is, is, is sort of very weak. This knight on c1 looks completely stupid. And, and yeah, it, it's no surprise that that maybe a slightly weaker player in Mangini didn't survive all that much longer. He tried to trade queens with queen b6, and Nidorf decided that, of course, that's never going to happen. And it, it, this almost arguably makes makes White's position even worse. Now Black is well poised to go to these dangerous light squares and start attacking this weak f3 pawn, and the queen on b6 doesn't really make a strong impression one way or the other. And so. Yeah, it's not easy to come up with a move here, and but already Mangini makes the final error. So take a second and think about why this move might be uh, the nail in the coffin. Okay, the problem with this move is that black can go queen d5. And it's not easy to see how how you can protect this f3 pawn, and if the f3 pawn falls, white's in all. <clears throat> and so the, the game continued, 25 knight a5. The pro there, there are problems with all of the attempts to, to hold f3. For instance, if queen e3, that exploits the fact that this knight is hanging on b3, and if rook e3, just simply bishop f5 is, is a complete blowout. Black, or white can't actually even move the rook. And so Mangini played knight a5, Nidorf took on f3, threatening the mate. And the only move white has is, is queen takes b7. But after, after rook d5, Mangini resigned. Quite a nice game. The most important thing to take away from this game is, is number one, that a higher rated black player used this opening to generate a little bit more imbalance probably than he could get otherwise. 
And the second thing to take away is that through a little bit of lazy opening play and inaccuracies, white allowed black to very easily equalize with the d5 break. It's kind of funny, when I was, when I found this game and, and I got to maybe playing through to about here, this position looked eerily similar to a correspondence game that I played maybe a couple years ago that, that ended up going into my book and I thought it would be kind of interesting to show that Th this idea of, of achieving d5 is not a one-off, and it can happen in a lot of variations in Sicilian. So th this might not be a shock to anyone. Uh, I, my game was a Kalashnikov, so um, the Kalashnikov goes 4e5, and then just very... I, I just want to show sort of the same thematic play for black. I won't go through a lot of the theoretical details. Um, White almost always goes knight b5 here to force d6. Again, like we saw in the, the intro earlier, something like knight f3 uh, allows black to to activate the dark squared bishop with, with, with generally bad consequences for white. So after knight b5, d6, my opponent played bishop c4, just controlling the d5 square. And I challenged that immediately with bishop e6. And he played bishop d5. I played bishop e7. I could also go just go straight forward knight f6, but I thought it, it might be useful to not allow bishop g5 for an extra move. So he castles and a6, knight 5 to c3, knight f6, and then white started to rearrange his pieces a little bit. He went knight e2, presumably to go knight c3 on the next move. Castles, bishop e3, rook c8. So already this already starts to look like sort of an unambitious nidor for white. He's played bishop c4 to d5, which is kind of weird, and he's played, he's played, he's managed to, to go knight g1 to f3 to d4 to b5 to c3 to e2. So obviously not, not particularly critical and, and not very sensible. The game continued pretty simply, and after f3, I struck out with a similar theme, knight b4. And after bishop b3... Bishop takes b3, c takes b3, I played d5, and, and won a, a quite nice game. So another example. And you can find uh, tons of examples of, of d5 in the Sicilian being sort of black's best chance. Another example is in the dragon, the Yugoslav attack variation, the dragon, characterized by g6. In the Yugoslav attack, white generally um, goes queen d2, and castles long, looking to throw his h-pawn down the board and perhaps trade off the dark square bishop, bishop h6. In this variation, white has two typical choices here, either castles long or bishop c4. The downside to castles long being that it allows d5 immediately. Uh, some people prefer bishop c4, but against bishop c4, it... it White loses some time with this bishop because it's exposed down the c file. For instance, bishop d7, castles long, rook c8, and then. So again, another variation where where d5 comes into play. And uh, humorously enough, a lot of dragon players uh, in the early days thought they could get an even better version with knight c6, d4, c takes, knight takes, g6. The point being that. They want to try try and save a tempo and play d5 in one push. For instance, something like maybe uh, and now I think yeah d5 is is good for black. Let me check to make sure I'm not I'm not saying things that are incredibly stupid. Yeah, d5 d5 looks okay. Uh. And not strictly a Sicilian, but a reverse Sicilian, you can see the d4 break. So there are very many reverse Sicilian lines starting with c4 and then e5 coming from the English opening. And you can get reverse dragons where the exact same thing happens. Kind of a funny, funny example where uh, white plays d4 in, in one go. For instance, here d4 is very strong. So this is a very similar concept just with colors reversed. 
And to go into even more depth, that the, that's the reason why a lot of times in these structures you see an early retreat of the knight to b6, for instance, knight c3, knight b6. Now the queen covers the d4 square, and after knight c6, it's quite a bit harder for white to get the d4 break in. Okay, so that actually pretty much concludes what I wanted to cover in video number one. Just a high-level overview of why you might want to play c5 in the first place and why white might want to enter the open Sicilian to challenge black, to press that development advantage in that extra space. Uh, and then we covered those two sort of miniatures, one where white smashed through in very typical fashion and another where black slowly wiggled out of the pressure broke with the the sort of classic Sicilian break d5 and and won a nice game. So I'll see you guys a little bit later hopefully in some specific videos that'll cover things like the Nidorf, the Schaveningen, the Dragons, the Kalashnikov, Sveshnikov, all the e6 Sicilians in more detail. Get a little bit more in depth into the theory. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you liked it uh, and I will talk to you guys soon.